Welcome to Chapter 9 of Integrated Activism. This is our ninth slideshow in our series, uh, looking at the book Integrated Activism that uh, I published through North Atlantic Books last year. Uh, this chapter is called Good Environmentalism and Bad, What Works, What Doesn't, and Why. Uh, we'll look at uh, various efforts to define or imply or apply uh, environmental technologies, environmental efforts, and see which ones work, uh, which ones do more harm than good, uh, and what the difference is. Um, so let's start off. Uh, oil, obviously, petroleum oil, has had an enormous impact on the modern world. The, single, the energy output of a single teaspoon of oil has roughly the energy equivalent of eight hours of human labor. Um, and that's really a profound thing to think about when you put 10 or 20 gallons in the gas tank on your automobile. Uh, that's a phenomenal amount of energy uh, that you're putting, excuse me while I adjust the microphone here, uh, a phenomenal amount of energy that we have access to that we are making use of. Um, the density and transportability of oil, of fossil fuel in general, uh, has an enormous impact on uh, what it can be used for, uh, how applicable it is in different circumstances. Fuel density affects the transportability and thus accessibility of different er energy sources. So uh, oil is even more transportable than coal. We see the coal on the coal train there on the left picture. Coal is still pretty transportable. Um, and that transportability and density combined uh, is what makes fossil fuels so flexible, so easily used in so many different applications. Natural gas is a fossil fuel, but uh, if you've ever seen natural gas flares and wondered why in the devil would they burn that stuff off, uh, we see the natural gas flares there on the right. It's a tremendous amount of energy, but it's very fluffy energy. Natural gas is very uh, fluffy, very not dense. Um, so it, it takes a lot of, either need, you either need a pipeline or it takes a lot of energy, a lot of work uh, to transport it. So that's the reason it's often flared off. It's just simply uh, difficult to move around. Now, these days they are compressing natural gas. We see on the bottom right there a natural gas tanker. That natural gas is compressed and refrigerated uh, so they can get a greater quantity of fuel on the ship to make it worthwhile to push that ship across the ocean. Now those tanks are high pressure tanks at very cold temperatures. God help you if they ever warm up or rupture it would be quite a release of energy. So the density of fuel has a big impact on how it's used, what it can be used for. Um, and it, this dense uh, fossil fuel fits very well with our individualized society. Uh, the modern industrial economy has specialized workers. Back in the old days uh, things weren't nearly so specialized as they are now. Um, some people were better at good thing at some things than others, but in a farming village, most people are farmers. Maybe there's a blacksmith, but there's not the degree of spe specialization that we have now. Now we have a very high degree of specialization. The village is broken down to the extended family, was broken down to the individual family, has been largely broken down to the individual worker, where a family will follow their primary wage earner around if there is a family at all. And in many cases, we have a lot of people simply living in an apartment by themselves or even in a house. Um, so if we have the uh, typical apartment there on the left, I don't think that's typical, that's fairly luxury, uh, luxury apartment there, but in any case, um, and we have the individual, in this case we're going to call him a computer geek, living in that apartment, the uh, flexibility and density of fossil fuel allows that individual to buy cheap uh, appliances. We have a, a stove there and a, and a water heater, very cheap, simple appliances that can take this concentrated fossil fuel and make it into usable energy. Um, the economics of it are such that this individual works all day in a, in a business complex somewhere, comes home, maybe cooks some food, uh, takes a quick shower, goes to bed. They don't, the economics of putting in a large solar energy system, uh, photovoltaic or solar hot water, um, are not as good because they just need a little bit of energy, they buy these cheap appliances, the energy is fairly easily available, so that there's a kind of a marriage between the individual society and this cheap uh, or this dense transportable energy. It's, it's, the energy itself is broken down into similar units as the workforce itself, uh, and the energy is, is usable through small, cheap appliances. The appliances or devices that gather, store, and use renewable energy tend to need to be larger to work effectively. 
Um, solar energy is diffuse, not concentrated, intermittent, some days almost no power available. Yearly average is 3.8 hour, hours a day. That's here in Virginia. Um, but even with that 3.8 hours a day, we can go for days or even weeks at a time in the wintertime with no sun at all or um, cloudy days. Wind is regionally available but extremely variable. It can be kind of a strong wind and then that wind can very suddenly die off and kick up again. It just comes and goes very quickly. So solar uh, renewable energies tend to be diffuse. They tend to be spread about. So you need uh, bigger devices, more complex devices to collect that energy, to store that energy, to use that energy. This is not as well suited to the individualized society. Um, the mistake people make in trying to apply environmental technologies, there's a few mistakes. Uh, mostly they're based in politics, trying to sell people on the idea that we can power the consumer society uh, with renewable energy. If we just are committed enough, have enough windmills, we can do exactly what we're doing, just do it with renewable energy or something very similar to what we're doing. But there's, at the basis of it, there's a very fundamental misunderstanding of how energy works and what it's good for, what it can be used for. Uh, on the left we see a, a chipper there, somebody grinding up tree limbs with a chipper. And this is in reference to a, a particular paper that I saw, which was a permaculture design paper that had been drafted. And somewhere in all the commentary there was a solar-powered wood chipper. Now this was an agricultural, supposed to be an agricultural system, integrated sustainable agricultural system. Well, a wood chipper is a device that is not used all that often. It might sit for days or even months between uses. Um, when it is used, it uses a lot of energy all at once. It's got a big engine on it. It needs a lot of energy to grind up that wood. Um, solar energy is diffuse. You get a little bit at a time. Um, to run a wood chipper, you would need a huge solar rack and a massive uh, battery system to run a motor that would run uh, infrequently. Um, it's the most absurd and um, uh, economically foolish notion of solar energy I've ever seen. But the thing you have to understand is that most of our equipment, meaning our air conditioners, our water heaters, these are all much more similar to a wood chipper in their intensity of energy use than they are to uh, those things which work well with renewable energy. Um, so that wood chipper is a heavy energy demand. Most of our energy demands are heavy, and renewable energy can struggle to keep up with that. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, renewable energy works great if you design from the principles of uh, availability of renewable energy. If you design your systems to take advantage of the strengths of renewable energy and compensate for, it w for its weaknesses, it works great. If you try to slap renewable energy on top of a fossil fuel society, it does more harm than good. And environmental groups are under a lot of political pressure to sell easy messages. Hard messages don't do very well when it comes to fundraising time. So we have here on uh, the upper left of this slide a uh, house. This is a house that I built in Charlottesville, Virginia. It's a cooperative house. It has a large solar rack on the roof. That's 10 flat plate solar thermal collectors. Um, this works, and it works really well. It works well because there's a decent economy of scale. It is shared use. There's not the individual bachelor in an apartment, so you have to have you know one stove for each individual. There's one stove for a bunch of different people. There's one hot water system for a number of different people. Um, that economy of scale makes it economically viable to build a much larger, much more efficient, effective solar hot water or even solar electric, although this house doesn't have much in the way of solar electric systems. These renewable energy systems work, start to work much better when you get a modest economy of scale. Um, this, uh, these tanks you see here, I'm going to use my cursor, that those tanks with the blue lid are solar uh, hot water tanks. So the solar fluid on that roof heats up those tanks. Those c tanks can store water for two or three days easily. So that helps compensate for the variability of availability of the solar energy. Um, given that you've got multiple users and different people use energy at different times, that tends to flatten that very spiky curve of, of peak demand, as it were. Um, now the pump you see down on your left, that's a DC pump. This is an ideal application of solar electricity. Um, you have sunshine that comes out and warms up those solar thermal panels on the roof of that building. You have solar hot, uh, it's antifreeze in this case, but a hot fluid that needs to move around. Well, at the same time that that sunshine is striking those solar panels, it can strike a DC uh, photovoltaic panel. That electricity can go directly to a DC pump with no computer controls, no nothing, just directly to the pump. The pump spins, the solar fluid moves, the whole system works. It's the perfect application of, of, renewable, of solar electricity 
because it's perfectly timed to when the energy is available, when the energy is needed, and it's modestly scaled, scaled to a uh, to what uh, solar electricity does really well. So if the wood chipper is the worst possible use of solar electricity, this is the best possible use. <coughs> it's also worth pointing out here that the the point of this whole system is to store energy as heat. So we're taking heat on a warm day, a sunny day, and putting it in those tanks and keeping it hours and for hours and days later. We're not trying to store electricity in big batteries, um, which is a much uh, less uh, efficient way to store uh, solar energy, econo le less economic way to store solar energy. So the environmental groups are under pressure to sell messages that sell easily. The message that's most easily sold is the green economy. We're going to put up windmills and solar panels. We're going to power the industrial society. We're going to create jobs, and everybody will be happy. Um, that, when it's based on an industrial scale application, um, it's uh, this is what you get. You get industrial scale uh, solar hot water. That's a solar thermal system out in the desert somewhere uh, running. This is a <laughs> this is just a Google search on. A turbine. I don't think that's actually a power generating turbine, but in any case, a big industrial scale turbine, similar to what you'd have when you've got a coal plant or a nuclear plant generating heat and blowing steam through a turbine. To generate high voltage electricity, they jack that electricity up to a half a million to, I think, 865,000 is the highest voltage I'm aware of. I've actually fought these power lines in some cases. Um, but in any case, that power has to be transmitted tremendous distances at enormous environmental cost. Um, to cook uh, the food for our bachelor in their apartment. And guess what? Somebody who puts up and owns all of this equipment makes a phenomenal amount of money. So this is industrial scale renewable energy. Whether or not it's better than coal or nuclear is really quite debatable. The other way to cook your lunch is to hang a pot in front of a parabolic dish. And this is what we do at Living Energy Farm. It works great. The difference is that naturally you can't do this every day. You can only do it on sunny days. Fine. But the big difference is you have to be around to take care of the pot. You can't do this when you come home from work at 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening or 6 o'clock. Um, you have to be there when the sun shines. So if you have an extended family or a village scale where somebody can cook food, at uh, cook lunch early in the day and then cook uh, dinner at 3 or 4 o'clock, I've cooked three, me three meals a day on this parabolic dish, but you've got to take care of it. You have to tend it. And that works at the village level. It does not work at the industrial level. But the environmental footprint, the environmental cost of that industrial scale, solar panels in the desert, big steam turbine, high voltage transmission lines just to cook your lunch versus hanging a dish in front of a uh, satellite dish with tinfoil on it, the footprint could not be more different. And this, again, <coughs> um, displays the difference between local, local use of renewable energy and industrial scale use of renewable energy. Scale is what makes renewable energy work. Uh, upper left there, we have an industrial scale biofuel plant. Biofuel is a disaster when it's done on an industrial scale. The feedstock for that plant has to travel long distances, whether it's wood or straw or whatever it is. The energy consumed is enormous. The output is minimal. Ethanol, um, biodiesel, these fuels, they barely put out more energy than they consume. The total, when you consider the total pollution land use issues, they probably do more damage than coal or nuclear. Whereas biofuel applied on the village scale, this is another form of biofuel, a simple village scale cookery, uh, a woman cooking food for her family there or for her village. This is a ethanol, uh, ethanol, sorry, uh, wood gas uh, generator that we have uh, bolted onto the front of that tractor right there. That's something we have at Liv Living Energy Farm. Um, again, village scale uh, wood uh, biofuel. The wood chips for that uh, wood gas system did not travel miles. They came from just right on the farm. Um, we also have on the right there our prototype uh, biofuel system. That is a uh, biogas digester, makes natural gas, methane. And again, the feedstock for that methane system came from within a quarter mile of the digester, right there on the farm. So scale is what makes renewable energy work, scaling it to the village level. The optimal scale for renewable energy, the largest scale possible, while keeping the user in immediate connection to the source of energy, aka the village. In other words, if the person using the energy can touch with their hands the source of that energy, that is the optimal scale for renewable energy. Not an individual, but everybody using it. So that's village scale because 
you get rid of these tremendous inefficiencies when you try to concentrate that dispersed energy. You get rid of the inefficiencies when you try to transmit and store that uh, dispersed renewable energy. It works really well on the village scale. Uh, the other form of environmentalism that works is simple conservation. Our housing design in the United States, there's nothing rational or sensible about it. It's based on the mimicry of what rich people in Europe did 500 years ago. They built palaces with big thin walls and now we try to build palaces with big thin walls and every poor person tries to build a palace even if it's a trailer it's still a palace that's as big as it can be with thin walls and a nice car parked outside. If we share space uh, or more modest in our demands for space and this is a straw bale house with 18 inch thick walls, conservation before production always. This is another design from Living Energy Farm. Um, this is how our uh, solar thermal systems work out there. Storing energy is heat. Our, our buildings face south, so we have a steep face on the, the southern roof. Uh, we have glass over the sheet metal, uh, foam behind the sheet metal. That heat is collected. It is blown by DC blowers. Again, direct use of the power, no stored electricity. Just when the sun comes out, blower turns, blows that heat under the floor. This is similar to what uh, you saw in that earlier picture of the house I built in Charlottesville, except this one is air-based rather than fluid-based because the uh, fluid-based systems have to have expensive copper collectors. This one has no copper. Um, so we're storing energy under the floor. If it gets a little too warm in the wintertime, open the winter. Uh, open the window. If it's a little too cold, put on a sweater, fire up the wood stove. Ve but very, very simple, very low-cost. Uh, low um, and when done on a cooperative level, very affordable because this is a little more complex than building an ordinary house. But when you're building that house for a few more people, the economics start to do magic. It really works really well. This is the solar south facing roof I was telling you about. This is actually in the dead of winter with ice all over it. But you can see the pipes that pump the uh, heat in and out of there. Now that roof has since been finished. There's glass over the front of that metal. Uh, that's our kitchen building. Also passive solar built into that south wall. Uh, funny that that picture was taken on an icy day. Uh, another village scale use of uh, photovoltaics, in this case that's the solar rack at Living Energy Farm that runs our uh, agricultural well. We need to pump water both for drinking and also to irrigate our seeds crops. Our seeds crops don't take up much space. We have just a couple of acres is enough to grow enough seeds to make enough money to take care of the whole community more or less. Um, so that one solar rack pumps enough water for us. Well that solar rack works hard all summer pumping that water in the winter. It didn't have, doesn't have much to do except it turns around and runs the, runs the blowers I mentioned in that earlier picture. That integrated uh, use where you can tie systems together very closely that only works at the village level. This is environmentalism that works really well. That uh, energy generated in the desert doesn't work well. It's a politically easy message to sell. That's bad environmentalism. This is good environmentalism if I may say so myself. It works well. You get to integrate systems in a way you can never dream of doing when you're trying to do it on an industrial scale. How hard is it to dramatically reduce the amount of fossil fuel we use? Woodfolk uses, uh, this is my house in Charlottesville, Virginia, 9% of average residential energy. Dancing Rabbit, this is an eco-village in Missouri, uses about 10% of average energy. Twin Oaks uses about 40%. These are all communities. These are all villages. Most people in the world use very little energy compared to industrialists. Environmentalism in America is simply defined as uh, trying to justify or trying to make people feel good about industrial society, the solutions are actually really simple. It's modesty and cooperation. Those are the two magic technologies you need to save the world from the Holocaust that we are creating for ourselves. Modesty and cooperation. In the absence of those two things, all environmental efforts are simple greenwash. They're simply trying to take the consumer society and make people feel good about it. Very, very simple solar hot water technology here. This is even simpler than the flat plate collectors. That's a batch collector we have out at Living Energy Farm. Uh, just uh, water tanks inside of an insulated box with glass over the front. This will supply all the hot water energy demands for eight or ten people all summer. For about eight months out of the year, this is all you need for eight people for hot water. And then you come to another house and they've got an electric heater in the basement powered by nuclear and coal. Uh, it's madness. This is so simple, so easy, so cheap. Modesty and cooperation makes environmentalism work. In its absence, there is no environmentalism. Solar oven, add this on to the solar cooker we showed earlier. Works reasonably well. Actually not as well as that parabolic cooker. Now we use it for a food dryer. There you can see uh, 
My dear partner Debbie putting uh, peppers in there. This is a picture from last summer, drying peppers for winter use. Works great for that purpose. So what it, when environmentalism doesn't work is when corporations get involved and try to keep their profit margin, try to hide real environmental answers while trying to make people feel good about consumption. What happened back in the 90s, there was a movement for returnable bottles. For those of you old enough, you might re remember returnable bottles from your youth. They have returned to some areas in Europe. The bottling industry and the plastics industry in general is terrified of returnable bottles. It would trash their profit coming and going. So they made a quick marriage with the environmental groups and got into plastics recycling. This is how you keep the disposable consumer society and make people feel good about it, with plastics recycling. Big bins full of plastic bottles. A truckload of bottles equals a truckload, truckload of air. The diesel smoke coming out of that truck, you see in the upper left there, is representative of the fact that plastics recycling does more harm than good. The amount of energy and the amount of pollute, the amount of energy used and the amount of pollution generated to recycle plastic costs more and does more damage than virgin plastic, than generating plastic from virgin oil. Because the plastic is so light, because the plastic is broken down into so many different kinds of plastic, because the plastic has negative value, it's not worth anything, the entire plastics recycling campaign that has been so effectively pursued all over the country is just greenwash. It was created by the bottling industry to prevent returnability. I know this because I was actually working on returnable bills, uh, legislative bills, back in the 1990s and got our butts kicked by liberal Democrats who then turned around and supported uh, liberal Democrats and conservatives too. Everybody hated recycling back, or hated returnability back then. And then they turned around and, and put plastics recycling in place. Now some of you may have heard about that great Pacific gyre, the, uh, the, the center of the Pacific Ocean that is now full of plastic. Valueless material has dubious recycling trajectory. Does it get dumped halfway to China? There is strong financial incentive to do so. When you have shiploads of material full of negative value material, this stuff is a liability. We pay companies in China to take this stuff and recycle it so we can bring it back here and sell token recycled goods. Well, that shipload of material has negative value. It is There's a financial incentive for them to dump that stuff at sea. Do they dump it at sea? See, I don't know, honestly. It's extremely highly illegal to do so. I suspect they do at least at times because it's negative value material. The opposite end of recycling by the way is an aluminum can. Aluminum is very high value material. It's not quite gold but it's what you can call a semi-precious metal. It's like copper. Very valuable. Very good idea to recycle aluminum. Um, but returnability is what really works in terms of saving energy. It just doesn't work for the, uh, the profit line, the bottom line of the bottling industry. So that's plastics recycling is bad environmentalism. Renewable energy, when it is applied to greenwashing consumptive environmental lifestyles, here is your hydrogen and veggie oil powered stretch Hummer. This is not renewable, obviously. Just because it came from a plant source has nothing to do with its renewability. Um, scale and modesty, uh, modesty and cooperation, that's what makes environmentalism work. This does more harm than good. Biofuel. People think biofuel is going to save us from all our problems. This is biofuel from the 1800s. We deforested the continent uh, through the 1800s. By the late 1800s, there was all of the easy, most of the easily accessible firewood and lumberwood in the United States was gone. That's the reason we transitioned to coal. We are now trying to burn trees again to generate electricity. The power companies are getting tax incentives to do so. It is greenwashed. It is not real environmentalism. Biofuel, modern biofuel, chopping trees up on an industrial scale it is completely unsustainable. It is a token effort that gets political chips for environmental groups and politicians to make people feel good about uh, their grid tie electrical systems. Environmentalism that works, cooperative use, conservation before production, appropriate scaling, village scale, that's what works. Renewable energy pr production, bioproducts reused, in other words when Biofuels, for instance, are used at the village scale. You can reuse the, the energy, doesn't, the material doesn't have to be transported very far and there can be a tight integration of systems uh, that allow you to use the different pieces, use the different uh, parts of the, of the systems in different ways. In other words, the, the material coming out of the biogas digester becomes fertilizer. The ash coming out of the wood gas system becomes fertilizer, put on the soil that needs it. When you have these big industrial scale systems, there are industrial scale biofuel uh, plants and the farmland right around them tends to get over fertilized and farms far away don't get enough fertilizer. It's just madness. Renewable energy works on a village scale. Technologies that require tending 
like solar cooking and biogas or in power. These are all good forms of renewable energy. This is what makes renewable energy work. On a village where you can tend things, take care of things, where a human being can interface with things, can touch it with their hands, renewable energy works great. It is an enormous improvement to being without energy. energy. Greenwash is when renewable energy is uh, used at an individual level and supported by industrial production or individual use supported by individual systems, poor scaling. Uh, tiny little systems for the individual don't work. Uh, they have to be so supported by in industrial scale systems. That doesn't work. Grid tie electricity is a, is a great example. It has to be supported by uh, centralized systems and there's no incentive to conserve. People these days are putting up all kind of grid tie systems and it does more harm than good because there's no incentive to conserve, there's no in incentive to restructure our economy in the way it needs to be restructured. And that restructuring is not very difficult. You simply have to create the incentives to do it. Recycled plastic is greenwash. Grass-fed beef, I'm sorry, it's greenwash. Uh, beef is, it, cattle are the number one source of methane, uh, human-generated methane uh, in the United States. Methane is 70 times to 100 times, depending on which numbers you look at, more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2 when measured on a 10-year cycle. It's a huge issue, but a lot of people these days don't want to have to be, oh my God, eat a plant-centered diet. Grass-fed beef comes along and gives people a, uh, a greenwash, you know, a, a way to feel good about eating their cheeseburgers once again. Hybrid cars, once again, greenwash, exp a very expensive, heavy, uh, industrialized technology, modesty and cooperation, it doesn't fit the bill. Spacious private environmental homes made environmental, nothing environmental about it. It's doing more harm than good. So there you have it, a summary of, you can look at the book, there's a lot more detail in there, but that's a brief summary of what works and what doesn't and why uh, the corporate influence gets in there naturally and screws things up. Uh, but mostly it has to do with power and scaling. Centralized societies are more powerful militarily, economically, and then we feel bad about our environmental impact, so we try to create centralized environmentalism. It does more harm than good, but it makes us feel better. Village-scale societies are not <coughs> as economic or militarily powerful, but renewable energy applied on a village scale is what is truly sustainable. It works, works great. You can really do magic with integrating systems very tightly at a village level. Uh, that's one thing we're doing at Living, Living Energy Farm, which, by the way, has a website at livingenergyfarm.org. Uh, my website is conav.org. Uh, look at the website, buy the book if you want to. Um, have a good day.